Okay, so I'm pleased to introduce um, the final speaker of this morning and indeed of today, um, who is Will Matthews from Cambridge. And he's going to talk to us about non signaling and PPT preserving codes. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. And thanks to the organisers for the opportunity to speak here. So, this is some joint work with uh, Debbie Leung from uh, IQC and the University of Waterloo. And the um, topic of the talk is essentially is uh, channel coding, in particular, so the transmission of quantum information over uh, noisy channels. So um, if we're interested in sending uh, the, oh, sorry, <laughs> the state of a, a d-dimensional, um, sorry, k-dimensional uh, quantum system uh, over a noisy channel, uh, we can use a, a error correcting code, which will just consist of an encoding map and a decoding map. Um, such that when this is composed with the uh, noisy channel that we're using, we get some overall operation M uh, that should map k-dimensional system to a k-dimensional system, and we want it to have you know decent uh, uh, ability to send quantum information. And uh, a nice way of measuring its ability to do so is the so-called channel fidelity, which basically just measures how well it can um, transmit uh, what, you know, one half of a particular isotropic maximally entangled state. Um, this is a nice measure because it's a simple function uh, of the average fidelity of the channel, um, which in turn gives an upper bound on the worst case fidelity of the channel. And it's also nice because it can be written as this simple linear functional of the um, Choi operator associated with the map M. So uh, Choi operator basically just being what you get when you act on half of this maximally entangled state with the map M, and then just normalize in such a way that this, um, it has this nice simple, uh, there's a nice simple expression for the action of a map in terms of its Troy operator. Okay, so our motivation is simply this, um, a ba very basic question. How large can this fidelity be for a given code size and noisy channel? Um, this is uh, the domain of so-called one-shot quantum information theory. There are many results of uh, addressing issues of this kind. So uh, the point being, it's a sort of finite block length question. This n could be one or more uses of a channel, but we're, we're not interested in asymptotics. So uh, particularly relevant to um, the quantum transmission of quantum information would be uh, the general converse and achievability results of data and say. Um, so this gives a upper and lower bounds on this effectively, which are nice in that they're asymptotically correct for many uses of the channel. Um, in that they recover the known um, expression for the uh, asymptotic capacity, uh, but it's not clear how to compute them at finite block length efficiently. Uh, then in some work with S uh, Stephanie Werner, which I talked about in QRP a couple of years ago, um, we were able to generalize results of uh, Polyansky, Poor and Verdue, and Wang and Renner, um, which uh, apply to classical channels and, uh, sorry, that should say classical, yeah, classical quantum channels. Um, <coughs> They relate that problem to hypothesis testing to get asymptotically correct converses for entanglement assisted codes, um, which are also because of the bound is an SDP and we can use uh, the uh, uh, permutation covariance of many uses of a mem memoryless channel allows efficient computation of the bound. Okay, but what if we're interested in unassisted codes? So in this work, um, we're gonna uh, take this approach to finding some bounds on the fidelity for unassisted codes, which is to start with a very general class of codes um, and then apply to those two kind of nice constraints, um, which are obeyed by unassisted codes to get upper bounds on their channel fidelity. And unfortunately, these aren't going to be asymptotically correct, um, but, but they are at least efficiently computable. Um, and they turn out to maybe have some quite interesting properties. So. This really big class of uh, codes that I'm going to talk about, uh, but sorry, I referred to earlier, are I'll just call forward assisted codes. So this is really uh, sort of ludicrously powerful in that we just allow the encoder and decoder to have any kind of an extra forward quantum communication they like. Um, so not very interesting from the point of view of um, their performance. They can always do arbitrarily well. But they're a kind of natural starting point in that this is actually the most, if we think of a code as a, a linear map from um, the noisy channel we're using to the uh, sort of encoded thing, 
th this n, which is not supposed to be a good channel, well, this is actually the most general form of linear map, which um, will take operations, i.e. CPTP maps, to operations, even when it's acting on just part of a multipartite operation. Okay, and this is a result of Curiella, Dariano, and Perinotti. Um, and furthermore, this, this map that I've just described, uh, it depends only actually on this bipartite operation Z, which I've outlined here, and which just is defined by this concatenation of these, these operations. Um, and the dependence looks like this in terms of the Troy operators for the respective, uh, uh, for, for M, uh, z the bipartite bipart bipart operation Z and the noisy channel respectively. So it's just this simple uh, linear function of the, of the code. So there's also a result by Egling, Schlingerman and Werner which says that this bipartite uh, operation corresponds to a forward assisted code if and only if it's non-signaling from Bob to Alice, which is nice and simple. So what does this mean in the context of quantum operations? Well, it's a sort of fairly straightforward generalization of the idea of non-signaling that we've seen a number of times for um, uh, classical uh, bipartite conditional probability distributions. Um, th maybe the easy way of saying it is if we have this bipartite operation Z, it's non-signaling from Bob to Alice. If, if we just trace out, throw away Bob's output system, then the channel that results from that looks just like a channel where Bob's input gets thrown away and Alice just applies some channel on her side which is independent of Bob's input. That's the non-signaling part. And this is uh, a nice constraint in the sense that it's just a simple linear constraint uh, that I've written here on the Troy operator for the bipartite operation. And similarly, there's a non-signaling from Alice to Bob is just given by this constraint on the Troy operator. Okay, so we can, the whole set of forward assisted codes then, we can write down what that is in terms of these Troy operators. Um, just because it uh, has to be the Troy operator of a, of a uh, CPTP map, it has to obey these two constraints, which will probably be familiar to lots of you. And then the fact that it's forward assisted um, corresponds to, the, to this non signaling from Bob to Alice constraint. And then the channel fidelity that that guy achieves when we're using this um, channel and trying to send K a dimension K system is just given by this linear function of Z. Okay, so this, uh, if we just wanted to optimize the performance of these, it's already a semi-definite program. Um, but of course, without further constraints, we can always achieve perfect fidelity. So the idea is to add some extra constraints which keep it a semi-definite program um, and apply to unassisted codes, but are, you know, um, so, keep, so, so we get something a bit more interesting. So uh, an obvious one to apply is the constraint that the Bipartite operation is also non-signaling from Alice to Bob. So this applies certainly to unassisted codes um, where the bipartite operation is one which is just consists of local operations. And in fact, to, be, to make the set nicer, we can also include shared randomness. So these could be correlated by shared randomness. That wouldn't change the performance, but it makes the set convex, which is nice. Um, and then it also includes entanglement assisted codes where they're allowed to um, both the encoding and decoding operations can operate on some shared entanglement, and that corresponds to the set of local operations and shared entanglement uh, in terms of the bipartite operation. And then we have these containment, uh, so unassisted is included in entanglement, assisted included in non-signaling. Okay, but this clearly doesn't actually distinguish between, um, uh, this bounds us away from just doing perfectly for everything, um, but it doesn't distinguish between uh, entanglement assistance and unassisted codes which is what we wanted to do. So another natural constraint to add is that the bipartite operation is, is PPT preserving, which certainly applies to unassisted codes. So um, an operation Z, bipartite operation Z is PPT preserving if whatever state we, if we put in any state row here, which is PPT with respect to um, this bi Alice Bob bipartition, then the state that comes out is also PPT, uh, even when we have these ancillas here. Um, and um, uh, these, I think, were first studied by uh, Reigns in this paper, which I'll come back to a few more times. Um, but I should also say, if we're just interested not in bipartite operations, but in channels, so like, let's imagine that this is a trivial uh, one-dimensional system, and so is this, so we just have a channel now from A to B dash. When this is PPT preserving, we call that simply a PPT binding, or uh, I'll say Horodesky channel, um, which is well known to have zero quantum capacity. And by a PPT preserving code, I just mean a forward assisted code whose bipartite operation is PPT preserving, which corresponds to this additional semi definite constraint on the, um, 
Choi matrix of the bipartite operation. And we've denoted this class by PPTP. So this contains unassisted codes, but it doesn't contain entanglement assisted codes. Um, and one more class I'd mention, the, it, it, which fits inside the PPT preserving codes, is forward assistance by um, Horodesky channels. So if you have a forward assisted code where F is one of these Horodesky or PPT binding channels, then it's easy to fairly easy to see that, that fits into the PPT preserving class. Um, so this already tells us that this class is going to sometimes have better asymptotic uh, capacity than um, unassisted codes, because from the superactivation result of Smith and Yard, uh, we know that a combination of Horodesky channels and, um, say, for example, the 50% erasure channel, which also has zero quantum capacity, can have positive capacity. So we do expect um, this PPT class to have um, strictly large capacity sometimes. When it okay, so th I've, I've sketched here the relationships between these various classes, and here's the unassisted codes that we're kind of maybe ultimately interested in right in the middle. Um, and all of these classes are closed under composition and, and convex combination. Um, and for each class, we can just define this uh, symbol I'll use for the maximum fidel channel fidelity that codes in that class can achieve for the channel n and sending k dimensional system. And using that fidelity, we can define um, a capacity, an asymptotic capacity for each class, um, we go, which is just the sort of usual definition where we demand that, um, well, it's the supremum of, of rates of communication which can be achieved with arbitrarily good uh, fidelity for that class in the large block length limit. And for the unassisted codes, this reduces to the normal definition of quantum capacity. So um, in terms of computing how well these uh, um, non-signaling and PPT preserving codes do, uh, we can make a nice super uh, simplification by using the observation that if we take uh, one of these forward assisted codes in one of these classes, actually any of the classes I've mentioned, um, well, because they're closed under composition with local operations, such as a local unitary here on Alice's input to the thing, and um, an application of the inverse over here, and under convex combinations, such as choosing those guys at random, uh, according to the Haar measure, I can always um, replace that code with uh, this code uh, Z bar, given by this kind of twirling operation, and uh, it remains in the class that I started in, whatever that was uh, from the set that I discussed before. And what's more, because of the U, U bar invariance of the uh, five class state, which appears in the definition of channel fidelity, uh, this has the same channel fidelity as the original guy. So I can assume without loss of generality that my you know, decodes uh, look like this. And then there's some standard results in representation theory, which have been used in, in a number of papers, uh, including uh, Rain's paper, which I mentioned earlier, um, says that uh, any code which is twirled like this, its um, Troy uh, operator has this simplified form where we just now have um, these fixed operators and we have some variables here. Um, and in terms of this simplified form, the state of uh, this channel input is this row A. Uh, it's given by this expression. We can just compute that directly. And then the non-signaling from Bob to Alice condition for this simplified code becomes this equation here, where you see the state on row A appearing, uh, row A bar, sorry, row A dash appearing over here. And we can use this to eliminate the variable gamma in the expression for uh, Z bar, and then simplifying that into the, uh, our objective function, as it were, which is the channel fidelity, that simplifies to this, while the other constraints simplify in this way. And further simplification is possible if we have a covariant channel. We can, that translates to some invariance properties of this operator, and we can use that to further reduce the size of the STP. Um, so the first thing I want to mention about these non-signaling codes well, uh, is um, that their power turns out to be pretty similar to sh shared entanglement, basically. So a uh, bit of history on non-signaling codes. So these were first considered um, in the context of success probability over classical channels in this paper um, by um, myself and Toby Cubitt and Debbie Lung and Andreas Winter, um, where we managed to give a single letter formula for the zero error capacity of these things. And then I studied the general case in this paper uh, where it turned out, to, to my surprise, that the, the performance of non-signaling codes in this classical context is equivalent to a, a, a recently demonstrated um, 
and powerful hypothesis testing based upper bound given by Polyansky, Poor, and Verdu in this paper. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, Stefan and myself gave a generalization of this for entanglement assisted codes, um, which also yields an SDP. So this is now for quantum channels. Um, and um, if I call that uh, bound B, so we have a, this upper bound on the fidelity of entanglement assisted codes B, it's given by this SDP here. And the only difference between this and um, the SDP we obtained for the exact performance of non signaling um, codes is that um, that one has an equality here instead of an inequality. So in fact, the SDP for non signaling codes uh, can only give a tighter bound on um, the performance of entanglement assisted codes. Um, and in fact, in the classical the case of classical channels, the, the, um, the bound you have here and the, the non signaling uh, bound, the, the performance of non signaling codes actually is equal. Um, so I, I kind of suspect that that should be true in general, but I, even though it's just this slight tweak in the STP, I haven't actually been able to show that. But what this does show us is that since this bound B was shown to be asymptotically tight in that it recovers the, um, this beautiful formula for the entanglement assisted capacity due to Bernich, Rohr, Smolin, and Thapliel, um, so entanglement assisted codes achieve that, and the, the upper bound which it attains this in the asymptotics um, applies to non signaling codes. So this shows that the quantum capacity for non signaling codes with this p potentially much larger power than entanglement assisted things is actually the same as it is for um, entanglement assisted codes. Okay, um, so what about PPT preserving codes just considered by themselves? Uh, so I've already mentioned these can have um, uh, potentially uh, higher asymptotic capacity than uh, unassisted codes would. Um, to relate this to the previous work of Reigns, um, we can use um, a, so, so, sorry, so Reigns gave uh, an SDP for the PPT distillable entanglement of um, states. So if we have some state row AB, he tells us, an, he gives us an SDP for how, um, how close the f I can get the fidelity of this output state here to the, um, this isotropic maximum entangled state, phi plus, uh, for with k by k dimensions, when this operation here has to be PPT preserving. Um, and he proved a number of interesting things about this, including an asymptotic upper bound. Um, and we can port some of those results over to the channel case by using this argument of Bennett, DiVincenzo, Smolin, and Wouters, or a slight modification of it. So the idea is um, this thing can be chosen to be non signaling in both directions without loss of generality, because we can always twirl on both parts of the output here. Uh, and that means the marginals will be independent of the inputs, basically. So um, the idea then is to, um, bec because that means then that you can implement it just using forward communication from Alice to Bob it, of some kind, um, we can kind of rearrange this uh, uh, distillation procedure um, and uh, apply that to, uh, so, so, you know, uh, uh, sorry, Alice can locally pr prepare the maximum entangled state here and she sends that out, puts it through the channel here. This is the Troy state then associated with this channel, and then they can apply the um, distillation procedure, PPT distillation procedure in this way, and then use teleportation to um, send information using that, what they've distilled. Uh, and this shows that the uh, fidelity for PPT preserving codes is at least as large as the PPT distillation for the Troy state associated with the channel. Um, and if the channel can be implemented using one copy of that choice state and just classical communication, uh, then these two things are actually equal. So in that case, w um, well, we, we have this equality, so we can use some of Rain's results where he managed to show what this is uh, in the case of PPT codes. And so one example where that applies actually is the Werner Halevo channels. So these are um, defined in the following way, or I've just given the example of a Q-trit Werner Halevo channel here. Um, so these are, I think they'd be uniquely defined by saying that they have a full unitary covariance um, where a unitary that's applied on the input uh, corresponds to a, the transpose unitary applied on the output. Um, and these are rather nice, you know, so they have this very high degree of symmetry which helps us to evaluate our bounds. 
Um, and this guy is actually a symmetric channel. So in the sense that the, um, the output, the complementary channel looks the same as the original channel, which means that the uh, quantum capacity is zero. So however, using results of Reigns, uh, you can show that the PPT preserving, the capacity of PPT preserving codes, um, even when you actually demand that they have to be zero error, is log of five over three. Um, so, okay, maybe this isn't so unexpected that one would have uh, some improvement here, but it's a, maybe a bit surprising that it's actually zero error. Um, and then I even if we apply also this non-signaling bound, it turns out that you can still get um, some zero error capacity using such codes. So you can have a code which is non-signaling in both directions, or it has, has to be non-signaling from Bob to Alice, but it's also PPT preserving and so, so what I've done here is I've just plotted the fidelity for the different kinds of codes for different values of um, the, si the dimension of the system we're sending um, for two uses of a Werner Halevo channel of three dimensions. And um, you can see that it, uh, one can attain perfect fidelity um, in sending a single qubit using two uses. So this shows that this capacity is at least um, one half. Okay, so... Um, a natural question then to ask is, can this be achieved by um, f forward assistance by Horodesky channels? Because if it, if it could, then that would be an example of the, the phenomenon of superactivation, where one would actually go from two channels with no quantum capacity to something which has a, the ability to perfectly transmit a, a qubit. Um, and I, I don't actually know the answer to this question, but at least can I, I can say something about the um, relative... Well, the relationship of the classes we've introduced. So, um, yeah, it's um, it turns out that you can at least show that you can have a bipartite operation which is PPT preserving and non-signaling in both directions, um, which can't be implemented by forward assistance over a Horodesky channel. Um, so the idea is this: if I have um, all all systems here are qubits, and M is a computational basis measurement. And the Hadam this is a, a Hadamard controlled by the measurement on B. So Bob can uh, put in a, a one state or a zero state here and choose which Hadamard gets applied to A. And then a computational measurement basis measurement is done here. And this is just to generate some random bit, um, which then gets XORed with this, so that the XOR of these guys is the outcome of the um, either the zero, one basis measurement or the plus minus basis measurement that Bob chooses to do on the A system. Okay, so this is LOCC, so it's PPT preserving, and it's also non-signaling in both directions because of this randomness we've introduced here and done this XOR. So the marginals here are, are just like independent of the inputs. Um, but if you try and implement this using some forward communication from Alice to Bob, then you can show that this forward communication has to have quantum zero error capacity. Uh, and that's just because um, if I concatenate this bipartite operation with some classical, the classical communication of one bit, from Alice to Bob, um, so that um, this Bob now actually gets the correct outcome of this um, basis measurement, which is done over here, um, then he can perfectly distinguish, but he can choose to either make a perfectly distinguishing measurement between the zero one basis or the plus minus basis on A. Um, and so that means that this overall channel G, wh which sent, which, so there's a forward channel G here consisting of all of this stuff, that sends the state of A to him, um, must support the ability to allow him to do that measurement. And there's a result of qubit and Smith which says that that means that G must have zero, uh, sorry, some zero error quantum capacity. And since this is just um, tensored with a classical channel here, that actually implies that F must also. Okay, so just very briefly, I can say that there's some numerical evidence to suggest that adding the non-signaling constraint um, does actually you know, reduce the capacity of the codes that we're looking at. Um, so, uh, yeah, with just the PPT preserving codes, you get the log five thirds capacity. Um, but if we add the non-signaling constraint and look at the fidelity at a rate which is slightly below that, this orange line here, then it appears to be decaying exponentially, which suggests that it doesn't have capacity at that rate. Um, but it might be a bit deceptive because at this slightly uh, higher rate, it eventually goes back up to one. Um, and so in these examples, 
these are quite a bad bound on the um, unassisted capacity because you know we know that the, these um, Werner Halevo channels actually don't have any quantum capacity at all. But uh, just to give another example of this, uh, of these bounds, um, here I've plotted them for the um, five uh, copies of the qubit depolarizing channel with depolarizing parameter alpha. So this is the identity channel here going down to more noisy channels. And the point of this is just that you can see that adding in the non-signaling bound does, uh, mixing those two um, constraints together, gets you something which is better than just taking the minimum of the PPT or non-signaling constraints. So hopefully this could be useful perhaps in just relatively small, um, in bounding the performance of relatively small quantum error correcting codes. Okay, so um, open things to do. Well, one would be to investigate adding further constraints that are tractable. So an obvious one would be some sort of K extendability uh, on, on the code, um, which I, I, I believe you should be able to basically have a, set, a sequence of constraints that would, uh, would converge to local operations of shared randomness, although they'll get increasingly expensive to compute. Um, it would also be interesting to know if we can actually work out the asymptotic capacity of these kind of codes, because then we'd, well, this would tell us something about, um, you know, when, they're when this bound is gonna be really terrible or when it's gonna be quite good. Um, and it would also be interesting to know if true zero error superactivation is possible. So can one really, uh, I, haven't, I haven't ruled out the possibility that one can have forward Horodesky channels, which um, would enable zero error quantum communication over, uh, for example, the three-dimensional Vernal Havo channel. Okay, so that's everything for I would like to talk about. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any questions? Anybody? Can I make a, a question? That's everyone's. Oh, yes, yes, Marco at the front. Thanks for this uh, outlook. Uh, why K extendability? I, I don't know, uh, maybe I'm misunderstanding where you're applying the condition. Why, why would it be related to the shared randomness rather than forward classical communication? I, w wouldn't you approximate an entangling breaking channel? Right, so you can, um, I, I think if you um, add in non signaling constraints as well as uh, K extendability constraints. This would act so if if you just demanded K extendability of a bipartite operation, then you'll converge towards something which is separable, a separable map. But I believe that if you, uh, I have some <laughs> evidence for this. I, I actually thought I had a proof of this, but I haven't. Um, I haven't managed to work out all the technicalities. But um, that if you uh, combine that with non-signaling constraints in the in the appropriate way, then it actually converges to, de depending on where you apply those non-signaling constraints, it either converges to local operations and one-way classical communication, or to local operations and shared randomness. Um, so there might be a possibility of doing that, but I mean, the, this will get more and more expensive, of course, as uh, as you if you're trying to converge to the, the true fidelity of un unassisted codes. Um, but I think it might be worth looking at. Thanks. Yeah, are there any more questions? No? If not, well, let's thank Will and all the speakers from this morning. <laughs> and um, I believe before you go to lunch, the organizers would like to take the conference photo. Is that correct? Are any of the organizers here?